let's look at one of the most classic, lovely, undisputed visual areas in the visual system. Uh, this is the visual motion area MT. Okay, so I'm going to zoom through this. Okay, so here is MT and a macaque monkey side view, that little blue thing right there. V1 in the monkey sticks way out on the lateral surface. Very convenient if you want to record from it. Okay, so there's visual area MT. And um, it's, it goes by lots of other names, and it meets all the criteria for a visual area. It is a parade case of a visual area, okay? And it has a human equivalent. Okay, so we're going to accelerate here. Oh, but I can't resist the little movie. So here are, this is a, an MT neuron responding when this pattern of light is moving. Okay, there's a bar of light moving across. It's direction selective. It's responding whenever that bar of light moves this way. Okay, see that big bar? It, when the bar goes back the other way, no response. Got that? Oh, and it's now outside the receptive field, no response. Right? And now it's in the receptive field and moving in the preferred direction of motion. Okay. Pretty soon they're going to change the direction and then they won't be. Okay, see it's already a slight change of direction, much lower response. Now no response. Okay. Everybody get how that cell is responding specifically to a particular direction of motion. Okay, that's called direction selectivity. MT is full of neurons that do that. Here's a depiction of one neuron showing you that this neuron likes motion in this direction. That is, responds more to motion in that direction than any of the other directions. Here's the firing rate of a bar moving in this direction, lower firing rate for bars moving other directions. Everybody good? OK. Um, so um, these neurons are also spatially arranged in little groups, just like you see for orientation and ocular dominance. So if you look across the cortex, just as orientation selectivity varies across V1, direction selectivity varies smoothly across MT. Everybody see what I mean by that? Yet another instance of this principle that next door neurons have similar preferences in the cortex in general. The cortex likes to do that. OK. Um, right. OK. I'm going to skip some of this. There's lots of other evidence. It's got very distinctive connectivity. There's MT right in the middle with a distinctive pattern of connectivity. Uh, it also has distinctive cytoarchitecture, that is, tissue properties. If you use a, this cytochrome oxidase stain, you see here's a flattened piece of cortex from a monkey brain. And here is V1, V2, various other Vs, and MT. And you can see this big, dark blob with a cytochrome oxidase stain. That just means that histologically, chemically, MT differs from its neighbors. OK? All right, so MT is different in function, in connectivity, and cytoarchitecture. Cool, huh? OK, so MT has also been found in humans. Um, what you can do, actually, I'm going to skip ahead. Right before lecture, my trusty lab tech gave me um, a really nice demo. OK, so here is um, in a human brain. Back of the head here, V1 sticking out. Most of V1 is in the sulcus. Here's MT right out there. OK, in me, it's like, I don't know, there or so, right? Right out on the surface. You could zap it with TMS. People have done that. What do you think happens when you zap MT with TMS? What do you interfere with? Yes, absolutely, yeah. You don't interfere with perception of shape or other things, but you are less able to tell direction of motion, OK? OK. So. Um, now, all of this, I skipped over some of the details, but you can map it with functional MRI. You can show moving dots versus stationary dots. And if you do that, you find MT, OK? But now, we want to know, does MT, yes. Yeah, OK, good. Does MT underline, uh, underlie our experience of motion? Like when we see motion and we perceive it and are aware of it? Do we get, is that what MT reflects? Or does it, just, does it just respond whenever there's motion in the stimulus? Well, those are really hard to pull apart. Because usually when there's motion out in the world, we're perceiving motion. So we need a case where we can pull those things apart. 
How are we going to do that? We're going to do that with another after effect. Okay, so now you've got to stare at the dot again. Okay, stare at the center right there. Keep your eyes right on the center. So now we're doing something much like what we did before. In, but instead of adapting out a pool of neurons that like a particular orientation, now we're going to adapt out a pool of neurons that like a particular direction of motion. And that direction of motion is different all over the visual field. And at some point, this thing is going to stop. And when it does, keep your eyes right on that center, and you can tell me what happens. Did it shrink? Do you guys get how this is exactly analogous to the tilt after effect? You've adapted out all the neurons that are responding to outward motion. And so the net signal that's coming from your system is, on average, it feels like it's going medially. OK. Now, you can see that with functional MRI. So here is, a, um, here is the data from a key paper from 1995, early days of functional MRI. People had just figured out how to identify MT with functional MRI. And they did that experiment that you just saw. They showed expanding rings for 30 seconds, stationary rings for 30 seconds, alternately expanding and contracting rings that don't produce adaptation because they're going in both directions, right? They don't produce net adaptation. Stationary, contracting. So what you see is this is the time course of activity in MT over that experiment. First thing you see is it responds more to the moving conditions than the stationary conditions, right? We know that. MT likes motion. It responds more to moving than stationary. There it is. But there's another cool, subtle thing here. Look at how that signal drops off in the stationary phase. Look at how it drops off more slowly after mere expansion than it does after expansion and contraction. Here you have an after effect, and there you don't. In both cases, you're staring at stationary rings. There's no motion in the stimulus. In this case, you're perceiving motion. And in that case, you're not. Does everybody see how this is showing you the neural correlate of your experience of motion, now unconfounded from what's happening in the stimulus? Because the stimulus is the same in those two cases. Make sense? Cool. I didn't get to um, why we have so many visual areas in the first place, but we'll do that next time. All right. See you all.